Loch Ness. I don't tell how many books have been written about Loch Ness. Here's the enigma of Loch Ness. And again, many, many stories. I read, I don't know about all of them, but I've read an awful lot of them, probably a hundred books just about Loch Ness. Because some tell the same stories. You know, the same stories appear in many books. And other times you get you glean new things from uh, other authors. There's a website, lochness.co.uk, if you want to uh, get on there website, or cryptozoology.com, good websites about this. In northern Scotland, uh, Loch Ness is a long lake, it's 24 miles long, about a mile to a mile and a half wide. Loch Ness is extremely deep, it's about uh, nearly 1,000 feet deep in places. Now before 1933, there was re not really good access to the lake. If you wanted to see Loch Ness, you had to climb over the mountains. There are mountains on both sides of the lake. It's in a very deep valley called the Glen, the Great Glen or something like that. Loch Ness actually, if you look at it, is part of a channel. I'll back up a couple slides here. It, there's a, you can swim all the way from, all the way across Scotland through these different lakes that are connected, lakes and rivers. Loch Ness is connected to the ocean uh, via a river. Uh, look at the north end there. You can see the little river goes up to the small town of Inverness. It's seven miles from this little town, which has about 20,000 people seven miles up to Loch Ness. If you've ever taken a boat ride for seven miles, you know how monotonous that can be because boats typically don't go real fast. But about the only access to this lake was go up the river seven miles. And that's just to get to the end of the lake. You want to go 24 miles to the other end and turn around and come back. It's an all-day trip to go the length of Loch Ness. There were some old monasteries built along there and some old castles. The Urquhart Castle is there on Loch Ness. But in 1933, some guy decided to put a road in on the edge of the lake. And because it's real steep and from the mountains, that's not as easy as it sounds. They had to blast a groove into the mountains, like they do up in the mountains of Pennsylvania. You know, you've got to cut a V out of the rock to, to get where you're going. So in 1933, they blasted a, uh, a roadbed and put a road in. Now, you did not have to go over the mountains to get to Loch Ness. You could just drive along the edge of it. Nice, curvy, windy, scenic tour. This uh, picture shows the Loch Ness Road from the other side, as my drawing did on the last one. This author said there have been 9,000 reported sightings, 3,000 of them recorded. Now, in 1933, when the road was put in, there were 52 separate sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. Many people have guessed that possibly because they were dynamiting along the edge and it was a lot of noise, blasting rocks into the lake, it disturbed whatever was in there. Who knows? The creature certainly could have swum out to the ocean because it has access back and forth to the ocean from this from Loch Ness. Today, uh, in the year 2000 here, it's a little over 11,000 reported sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. This is from In Search of Mysteries. Let's see, I've got, I'm sure I've got that here somewhere. Uh, if you want to read it for yourself, there's tons of books on this topic. Encyclopedia of Monsters. And, anyway, um, he said 9,000 reported sightings, and now it's over 11,000. There's no question some of the 11,000 sightings are hoaxes, lies, you know, fraud. Somebody floats a rubber ducky and takes a picture and claims they saw the Loch Ness Monster. There certainly is some tourist value to this, you know. Brings a lot of tourists in because they claim they've seen Loch Ness Monster, and then, of course, that's money. So, but the fact that there's a few frauds doesn't mean they're all frauds. What some people do is they get the mistaken idea, if they, you know, if they can prove one of these sightings to be a fraud, that proves they're all frauds. Well, that's silly. That's like saying, if I can find one counterfeit $20 bill, that proves they're all counterfeit. Well, that's a poor example because they are all counterfeit since the Federal Reserve just prints them, you know. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the uh, different uh, tabloid newspapers will always put something in there about we captured the Loch Ness Monster, you know, and it has a baby like this one here. But Sir Peter Scott... As a member of Parliament, he claims he has seen the Loch Ness Monster. He wears the shirt, I believe in the Loch Ness Monster. That would be the equivalent of a U.S. Senator. He claims, and most people claim, it's a plesiosaur. Now, when you read all the books about Loch Ness Monster, and again, I have read lots of them and lots of articles and stories and sightings, they will, almost all of them, describe a plesiosaurus, a long neck, four flippers, short tail. Some of them describe humps on the back, some say there are no humps. I've read at least one, maybe two stories, where somebody said they saw the creature going very slow and there were humps on its back. 
Several people describe it as bunches on its back. And then there were two of these stories that said they saw all of these bumps straighten out into one big hump as it took off swimming real fast. Who knows? The theories are uh, that probably, the best theory that I'm aware of is that probably these, as the creature is going slow, the muscles are contracted on its back, making the bumps. And then when it swims fast, the muscles straighten out into one long hump. You got a better idea? I'd love to hear it. But when you read these articles about... Uh, Loch Ness Monster like this one is from the book Strange Animals, which I don't think I have out here. But uh, he says, Others insist Nessie must be a plesiosaur. One thing wrong with this theory is that plesiosaurs are believed to have become extinct 70 million years ago. Now hold it. There's nothing wrong with the theory. There's something wrong with his prejudice because he's already decided he believes in evolution. Arthur Grant is a veterinarian student. He nearly ran into Nessie on his motorcycle one night. 1.30 or 1.40 in the morning, he's driving down this, uh, this new highway there in 1934. The road's just been in for a year. And Nessie scooted across the road in front of his motorcycle. Now, the guy's a veterinarian student. He ought to know something about animals. So he drew this sketch after the sighting. He said it moved very clumsy like a seal with flippers. Here's the sketch he drew of Loch Ness Monster. Alexander Campbell is the game warden, was the game warden for Loch Ness for 47 years. He said he saw it 18 times, and it looks like that. That was from his 1934 sighting, shortly after the road was put in. <clears throat> Cages have been built. They've baited the traps with everything you can imagine and some stuff you cannot imagine, trying to capture this creature into the traps. They've tried all sorts of things to get Loch Ness Monster. You have to understand, Loch Ness is a huge lake. It's big enough that everybody in the world could go drowned in it at the same time. It would hold the entire world's population of 6 billion people would fit in that lake. And it is very black water. Uh, it is, it's got so much suspended peat particles in it. Here is a bottle of water from Loch Ness. Because it's in a valley between... Uh, these mountains, when it rains, uh, especially peat, which is partially decayed plant material, washes off into the water and very, very slowly sinks to the bottom. Any little movement or storms or disturbance, you know, makes the water muddy, like a mud puddle. I'll pass this around. If you shake it up, you can see all the stuff floating in here, the suspended peat particles. That is what the whole lake is like. Now, if you get enough of that stuff together, you get six or eight or ten feet, it eventually blocks all the light. And so the top six feet might be fairly clear, and the deeper you go, the darker it gets, and you get down six, eight, ten feet, and it's black. Sunlight can't penetrate through all of that stuff floating around. And so you've got a lake nearly 1,000 feet deep of pitch black. You can't see anything. There's just too much stuff floating in the water, just like a mud puddle. Shine a flashlight into a mud puddle sometime, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The light just simply won't penetrate. Many sketches have been drawn of this creature. The Spicer family said they saw it uh, with a sheep in its mouth, headed back for the lake. Um, one guy heard a disturbance in the water. He had some friends hold torches, and he went out there and took a picture, uh, and he got a picture of a hump and a neck. Off to the uh, right, you can see the neck sticking out. Now, when they republished this picture... In Reader's Digest, they cut the head off. You know how they crop pictures to make them fit? All you see here is the back. In the Reader's Digest, uh, well, Reader's Digest abridged version, <laughs> they cut the head off of the creature. McLeod said he watched it through binoculars uh, for 10 minutes. Tim Dinsdale, the author of this book, Loch Ness Monster, which is still on the shelf in there, uh, Tim Dinsdale was an engineer from England or London, I believe. He went and saw the Loch Ness Monster. He said he videotaped it for several, for like a minute, or filmed, filmed it with a film. It was great distance. It was zigzagging back and forth across the lake. He took the film to the, uh, I believe it was the military, uh, the Royal Air Force, the guys who analyze film, you know, like high altitude pho photography. And they said it's definitely an animate object, the living object. And Tim got so excited about what he saw that he quit his job, bought a boat, and went and lived on Loch Ness. He wanted to see it again that bad.
dedicated the rest of his life to researching, interviewing people who've seen it, gathering information. Uh, to my knowledge, he never saw it again. But uh, he's written several books. He just died here several years ago. But he wrote several books on the Loch Ness Monster. He describes, for instance, Torquil McLeod, who watched the critter for nine minutes through binoculars and drew those sketches. McLeod, after watching it nine minutes, said, I think Loch Ness Monster looks like this. Uh, many people have drawn sketches. Some people say it has uh, horns or tubes on its head. All sorts of speculation is about this. Most people do not describe anything on its head. A few say it's got bumps sticking up, and they think there might be retractable breathing tubes, you know, like a snail's eyes. His eyes will stick up, and when you touch them, they go back down on his head. There's all sorts of guesses on this. Nobody knows for sure what it is. But World Book Encyclopedia put a submarine in Loch Ness. They brought the submarine from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Dan Taylor built it, and they brought the sub over there, put it in the lake. There have been three submarine attempts. They've tried white ones, yellow ones, and I think red ones were the other. It's in one of these books here about uh, to capture, to see the Loch Ness Monster. Dan Taylor went down in his sub, and here's what he said. Uh, he said uh, he now lives in Hardyville, South Carolina. He said, Nessie is pretty elusive. I thought I got her. Something was lying on the bottom, and the wash from it threw my submarine way off course. He's going along, and something huge took off, and the, the backwash from it threw his submarine, turned his submarine around. Website, uh, nessaproject.com. If you want to see, he's building another sub right now to go over there again. Now, he's getting to be an old man, but he has just devoted his life to this. He is so convinced there's something in there. The Japanese came over and put 24 boats in Loch Ness, and drove the entire length of the lake with sonar. All of them had sonar devices. And as far as anybody knows, that's the first time the bottom of Loch Ness was scanned, continuous scan of sonar. They said the bottom of Loch Ness is wrinkled up like a raisin. There are many places to hide, and I'm sure Nessie heard 24 boats coming down the lake. This <laughs> water tra sound travels real good underwater. There appear to be caves off to the side up into the mountains. Some have speculated that there might even be what's called an airlock, where the creature could go from the lake up into a cave in a mountain and then back down into the ocean. So the, you know, the water wouldn't be transferred back and forth because same thing as the toilet, you know, with the, the siphon on a toilet. But there could be a, a mechanism of getting back and forth. You certainly can swim out the Inverness River, except there, there are uh, locks and dams in the way now. But even then, you could still get out. Uh, one guy did get a picture of a giant diamond-shaped flipper. Uh, the Academy of Applied Science, 1972, um, got this picture. Uh, Rhines, I think his name was. It's been a while since I read that story. But he said he, he dropped a weight down where the water was only 80 feet deep and it had a float on the top. And he attached uh, cameras that were sonar activated. And he put sonar device down there. So if anything swims in front of the camera, it'll trigger the camera to, to take pictures and flashes to go off. Understand, this is extremely dirty water, as you can see from the example there. And so the, the images here are computer enhanced from the images that he got with his film uh, because of the, the murkiness of the water. But again, it, it appeared to have diamond-shaped flippers. There's a fa fairly famous picture here from Reader's Digest showing Nessie with its mouth open. Many pe people describe humps. The surgeon's photo is interesting. They claim it was faked, and it certainly could have been. I don't know. But the story goes that a London surgeon was down there at Loch Ness with his mistress. And so he took this picture of Loch Ness Monster and didn't want his name associated with it because his wife is going to start asking questions. Where were you this weekend? Well, he was down at Loch Ness with his girlfriend. Anyway, that's how the story goes. But his nephew was dying, and somebody said they heard the nephew say on his deathbed that the whole thing was a fake, that they made a rubber toy and floated it and took the pictures to make it look like Loch Ness Monster so he could become famous. The story may be true. I don't know. But the last guy who could have known died. So there's no way to verify the story either way. I don't know who's telling the truth. But there are other lakes besides Loch Ness. There are several other lakes in Scotland describing creatures like this. And I don't have any of the books here, but I've read books about uh, Morgwar and uh, other lakes over there. Let's see, there's the... Uh, Loch uh, Morar, Loch Shio, Loch Lochy, Loch Ness, Loch Archaic, and many have legends about a creature similar to this. The uh, Morgwar is the Cornish sea serpent, uh, the part of uh, England sticking out down there at the bottom left-hand corner. 
something's been seen there. These two pictures here show the neck in different positions. Now, a series of photos is always good to show any movement. And you can see the neck is indeed straightening out. This was a long-distance shot, and so, you know, the picture's kind of blurry. People say, well, if there's a Loch Ness Monster, why doesn't somebody get a good picture? That's a fair question. I, first of all, I think some fairly good pictures have been taken. Secondly, I would ask you the question, how many of you have ever seen a car accident? You watched it happen. I have probably seen a hundred of them. We saw 50 in one day in an ice storm up in Wisconsin. Watched them happen all around us. We watched them going on like crazy. Um, I'd like you, somebody to get me a picture of a car wreck as it happens. Even if your camera is sitting there beside you, which it probably isn't, when the accident happens, you won't think in time to get the camera, focus it in, and take a picture. And even when you have a camera with you, when you see Loch Ness Monster, it's like, wow, what have I, and then it's gone and it's too late, you don't get a picture. So, English Channel has reported something like this, the English Channel, Sea Serpent, a sea dragon was listed in an old dictionary somebody sent me. We think the dictionary was 1766. The cover and first four pages were torn off, so we don't know, but I've got it in the office there. Um, the dictionary reported, though, a marine monster caught in England in 1749 called a sea dragon resembling in some degree an alligator, but having two large fins which served for swimming or flying. It had two legs terminating in hoofs like those of an ass. Its body was covered with impenetrable scales. It had five rows of teeth. Now a shark, pan over here, Steve, if you would. A shark has quite a few rows of teeth. Here is a uh, shark's jaw, and you can notice in the back all these different rows of teeth, immature teeth that are getting ready to flip up, or when the shark gets ready to bite something, he will uh, puff up his jaws, so a bunch of these teeth dig in at the same time. Some have speculated that the creature may be uh, in the shark family because of the extra rows of teeth. I don't know. All I can do is uh, speculate like everybody else and say there's something interesting over there. They describe the creature as having these five rows of teeth. Here's a picture of the one taken on the beach in Normandy, France in 1925. This appeared in Time magazine in 1934. The 25-foot creature washed up on the beach in Normandy, France, <clears throat> 1934. Two professors from Paris Natural History Museum analyzed the creature and said it was definitely not a whale, not a sea cow. It's possible we are in the presence of an unknown species, is what they said. There's a man standing there for scale. You can see the size of this creature next to whatever, what, man next to whatever this creature was. Uh, down in Brazil in 1905, uh, this creature was seen by some scientists on board a ship called the Valhalla, or Valhalla, cruising off the coast of Brazil, they spotted a dorsal fin six feet long, two feet high, and a small head on a neck about seven or eight feet long in front of the fin. The creature's color was mainly dark brown, turning white on the underside, and a good-sized body could be seen under the water. Two observers were two ex the observers were two experienced British naturalists, and they published their story in a book called The Proceedings back in 1905. Down by New Zealand, Japanese fishing boat pulled this creature up in 1977. They said it was 32 feet long, weighed 4,000 pounds. They were dragging their net 900 feet down because right off the coast of New Zealand is a place called the Chatham Rise where the Japanese do a lot of fishing because the water is only 900 feet deep, which sounds deep, I know, but compared to the rest of the ocean, which is 12,000 feet deep, this is not much. They said the creature was rotting and it stunk and it smelled terrible, so they threw it back. But they did take quite a few photos of it, and they um, saved some of the tissue. When they picked it up with the net and tried to set it down, it broke in half, and white pus oozed out everywhere. So it had been dead for some time, maybe even uh, more than a week it had been dead. The zoologist on board the, the ship, and this was a giant fishing boat, the zoologist on board drew this sketch and said that's what it looked like. Four flippers, long neck, long tail with all the Japanese writing on there. They made a special stamp for Japanese mail <clears throat> that year, 1977. They said it's the greatest find in 100 years of Japanese science. And that's a commemorative stamp. Now, the, shark, or the, the tissue that was kept was analyzed, and they did a protein analysis. And they said it was 96, I believe, 96% similar to shark protein. And so some of the American skeptics said, see, it's not a dinosaur, it's just, or not a plesiosaur. And some people get after me for calling it a dinosaur because it's actually a marine reptile. 
well, I understand, but look up any book on dinosaurs. You'll find plesiosaurs listed in there. Uh, every kid thinks it's in the dinosaur family. But they said it's 96% similar to shark protein. And they said, see, it was just a basking shark. The excuse they always give for these creatures is they say it's just a basking shark, which is a monstrous shark. And when it dies, they say the gills rot and fall off, the flippers fall apart, and it ends up looking like it has four flippers and a long neck, when actually that's just his spinal cord and the gills are gone. I've read all that stuff. I've heard all that stuff many times. The people on board who had it said, look, we know what a basking shark is. It's not a basking shark. They also, when they analyzed the protein, they found it's 96% similar to shark protein. I believe it's a lasmatin or something like that. They said, see, it's just a shark. I want to hold it. First place, nobody's ever seen plesiosaur protein to know what it's supposed to look like. Secondly, 96% similar means it's 4% different. 4% of the DNA code is a lot of information. Humans and chimpanzees are supposed to be 99% similar. But obviously, humans and chimpanzees are extremely different. So 4% doesn't impress me, because that's just a cop-out to say, well, it's just a, just a basking shark. I'm sorry, I just don't buy that. The people who had it in their hands said, no, it's not a basking shark. In Russia, what does that say in Russian across the top there, brother? Puzzle. Mystery? Puzzle of lake. Mystery of the lake. Okay. This article in uh, Russia says, describes the animal that was seen. Uh, in this lake that had a fin on its back. Interesting. What looked like a huge dinosaur washed up on the beach in Russia on the north coast in 1994. They said the creature was 39 feet long. Northern island of Japan has a creature like that. I just talked to a missionary over there uh, yesterday, a day before, recently here. I'm going to the central island of Japan, Tokyo area, in a couple months, and he's a missionary on the north island. Uh, I forget the name of the island now, but He's, he's going to do some checking on this creature, but hasn't been seen since 73. But there were rumors of this lake over there up in the mountains of uh, a creature like the Loch Ness Monster. There's a lake in southern Japan on the South Island right there uh, where they call the creature uh, Issy. Nessie, Loch Ness Monster is called Nessie. This one's called Issy. Uh, there's a big lake over there, uh, Lake Ikida in Japan. China has one. Where some people said they saw one. They called it a USO unidentified swimming object. The monster was golden yellow in color, had a long neck, beard, a horn the size, a horn head the size of a wash basin. Here again we have the report of the horns on the head. Nobody knows what it was. Reuters News Service reported in this lake in Sweden there have been 450 people who claim they've seen this creature, a similar creature to Loch Ness Monster, in one of the lakes up there in, in Sweden. Canada has many lakes reporting creatures like this. Canada's Lake Monsters. We sell the book through our ministry here. Nessie's Canadian cousin. Scientists are believers. Down in southern British Columbia, just north of Washington State, is the town of Kelowna, which is right on a monstrous lake called Lake Okanagan. Lake Okanagan is 80 miles long. That's uh, from here to what? Biloxi, Mississippi. Just about. 80 miles, long lake. There's a million dollar reward out if anybody can capture the Ogopogo. This plaque is up there about Ogopogo's home. Before the unimaginative practical white man came, the fearsome lake monster, Nahatik, Nahatik, whatever, was well known to the primitive superstitious Indians. His home was, to believe, was believed to be a cave at Squally Point, and small animals were carried in the canoes to appease the serpent. Ogopogo still is seen each year now, but now by white men. Uh, the million dollar reward is quickly withdrawn for fear somebody would go out and try to kill it, you know. But at the end of my video number three, I have interviews on there with people who claim they've seen the Ogopogo, as the creature is called. This article by Mary Moon says, Ogopogo, uh, here it says, they were the latest among thousands to see something strange in this narrow 80 mile long lake in southern British Columbia. I interviewed this guy on top for nearly an hour. These four men spent their lifetime fishing out in the Atlantic Ocean, off, off the coast of Cape Sable Island, Nova Scotia, right there. He told me the story. He said, Brother Hoven, I was out there. I met him in 1992. There's his phone number right there. He said he'd been fishing since he was five. His whole, this is a bunch of fish, fishing village there. I preached in, the, in that village. He said, I'd been out there fishing since I was five. He was 67 at the time, uh, so 62 years of experience out there on the ocean. 
He said, I've never seen anything like it. I don't ever want to see anything like it again. He said, this creature came out of the water and chased our boat from one to two miles. He said, uh, it was 40 to 50 feet long. It held its head out of the water about 15 feet, so it's not a fish. Uh, he described it as having four-foot tusks like a walrus, as like in sharp pointed finger, uh, teeth about the size of his fingers. I showed him the plesiosaur. He said, no, it's not exactly like that. The neck was thicker, two foot thick, eight or nine feet long, with nine-inch diameter eyes. And he said the eyes were set at an angle from the front. Because I asked him all these questions. I said, were the eyes on the front, like humans, or on the side, like a fish? He said, kind of at an angle. So it's not on the side, like a fish. He said he could see no visible means of propulsion. Many people describe Loch Ness monsters having a hump on its back, moving very fast, but you can't see what's making it move. On a whale, you see the tail go up and down. On a shark, the tail goes side to side. They don't see what's making this move. If it's four flippers underneath, you know, it can be doing the flipper movement and swimming, and you don't see what's happening under the water. He said uh, it was grayish brown, covered in barnacles, rough textured, and did not appear to have scales. They were six miles south of Cape Sable Island. He said the water was 180 feet deep and flat cam. They pronounce flat calm. He said, it's flat cam. I had to ask him to explain that. He said, oh, no, no waves. Oh, calm. Okay. He said, I don't want to see it again. I've got the whole interview on audio tape if you want to listen to it. The Cadborosaurus is the one seen in Cadbury Bay, British Columbia, which is uh, north of Washington State. It's been seen as far south as Oregon. Professor LeBlond at the University of British Columbia published a paper on it. He wrote this book. Uh, Professor LeBlond and Bousfield uh, wrote this book about the Cadborosaurus, and we sell the book if you want to read it. They describe it as having a long neck and short pointed front flippers, a horse-like head, and distinct eyes. A couple of pilots saw it in 1993 and reported it in Carl Schuker's book, The Unexplained. Let's see. Unexplained by Jerome Clark. Unexplained by Carl Schuker. So, they must still be in the library there. Yeah, it's still in the library. Oh, here it is. No, this is another one by Jerome Clark. Um, I got Schuker's book, too. Anyway, the, he, he's an English scientist who writes a lot on this topic. A baby one was captured in 19... Uh, I don't remember the date now. But a guy was sailing out there in this huge bay, and this thing went swimming past his boat. So he put his dip net down and pulled it up, dumped it into a bucket full of water, and drew that sketch of it. He didn't have a camera, but he drew this sketch, and he said the thing was scratching, obviously distressed, trying to get out, you know, panicking. So he dumped it overboard. Didn't save it. But there's two little front flippers, bumps down its back like scales, large eyes, and a head shaped sort of like a horse. That's what they describe it as. We sell this book also, Monster, Monster, about North American lake monsters. I talked to this man. His name is Jacques Beauvais. He's a Canadian uh, researcher who does research on the Lake Memphremagog monster. This is a huge lake that goes from Quebec down into Vermont. Or if you're an American, it goes from Vermont up into Quebec. But Jacques lives in Magog on the northern end of this lake. There's his phone number and address. I talked to him for three hours, videotaped the interview with him. He, he tapes interviews with folks who've seen this creature. In 1992, there were 26 people who saw it, as an example, kind of a typical year. Something's been seen in Chesapeake Bay Ches in, uh, um, here in America, in the Potomac River. They describe it as looking like the Loch Ness Monster. In uh, the south end of Rhode Island, there's an island off in the ocean there called Block Island. There's a picture of the Block Island. On this uh, island in 1996, this creature washed up on the beach. Someone stole the bones later, but it's about 14 feet long. Nobody knows what it was, a totally new creature. Lake Erie reports something called Erie's Bessie, matches Nessie. Here's an article from the Pensacola News Journal back in 1990, where they described the creature as being 35 feet long, black, having a snake-like head. Um, boaters spot the Erie monster from here on Ohio Associated Press. Serpent-like creature makes Lake Erie its home. And you can read books on it and watch my videotape on that. I talked to John Kraft, who saw and photographed the Lake Erie Monster. My interview with him is on the end of tape number three. He said, Mr. Hoven, I was going to photograph the sunset. I was there with my wife, and I think it was her brother and his wife or something like that. But he said, I was getting the camera set up, and they said, what is that? And we looked over, and at first we thought it was 100 men swimming in a row, having a race. And we thought, boy, it's getting almost dark. It's getting kind of late to be swimming in Lake Erie. But then it stuck its head up. 
He said, by the time he got his camera put together and focused in, the head was down. All he got was the back. He said, sorry, that's the best I got right there. I showed him my plesiosaur model. He said, no, it's not quite like that. The neck was a little shorter. Pete Peterson is a taxidermist who lives on Lake Erie. People catch fish. He stuffs them and mounts them. He was walking on the beach in Lake Erie and found this creature. Seagulls were pecking at it. He took it down, took it home, stuffed it and mounted it. He said, I don't know what it is. You tell me. Carl Bob bought it off him, took it down to Glen Rose, Texas. When they did a CAT scan of it and an X-ray, and now they're doing a DNA analysis, they found there's a fish hook stuck in the head. So apparently it got caught sometime and broke the line or something. The fish hook is still up, stuck in its head. Um, nobody knows what the creature is. Situate Harbor, I stopped there and saw the uh, people who saw, were the first ones to see the Situate Harbor monster. 1970, this critter washed up on the beach. I talked to the sheriff, who was the first one there on the scene. It, it washed up at 2 in the morning. It stunk terribly. You could smell it for three miles. So the sheriff was called. He went out there to see what the stink was, and it's this 50-foot-long creature laying on the beach. As soon as uh, a rock radio station heard about it, they started announcing at 2 a.m., hey, there's a sea monster washed up on the beach in Situate Harbor. And people came down for miles, and all the highways and streets were blocked for miles. People trying to get to see the sea monster at 3 a.m. Anyway, everybody brought hatchets and machetes, or most of them did, and started cutting off pieces and taking it home so they could have a piece of the sea monster. By the time they got some pictures of it, it was all chopped up. The health department came out and said, we don't care what it is. It stinks. It's dangerous to contaminate the community, so they blew it back into the water with dynamite. But uh, the Woods Hole Oceanographic people, scientists, came down and cut the head off and took it back in a dump truck. The head filled a dump truck. They analyzed it, the protein, and said it's a basking shark. Again, they always call them a basking shark. That's their standard answer. I doubt that duels will be fought on the proper name of, for the monster, with the experts at Woods Hole stating it's a basking shark and Dr. John Hannon positively refusing to accept anything but a real sea serpent. Edward Rowe Snow wrote a lot about the creature since uh, he lived there in that area. On the coast of California, in 1925, this animal washed up on the beach. This is from the article, California's Nessie, in uh, Skin Diver magazine. You can see the guy behind has a rifle just in case it moves again. What you're seeing there is the head. There's the eyeball on top. Kind of a rounded dome-shaped head, like a basketball sort of shape, with a beak on it. The neck was 20 feet long. I got a call from an atheist, or a red letter from an atheist one time. He said, Hovind, you're so stupid. Don't you know that was a whale? <laughs> I wrote back and said, please show me any neck on a whale. Where's the neck on a whale, please? But uh, the people who examined it, like the president of the British uh, Columbia Natural History Society, he said, my examination of the monster was quite thorough. It had no teeth. The head is large. The neck 20 feet long. The body is weak, and the tail is only three feet in length from the end of the backbone. With a bill like it possesses, it must have lived on herbage, plants, and undoubtedly inhabited a swamp. I would call it a type of plesiosaurus. It had two short front flippers, two short feet or flippers, and probably swam with its head high above the water. Some fishermen had watched it get killed the day before by a bunch of seals. Now, for many years, this creature had been reported in the coast of California. The fishermen called it the old man of the sea. You'd see it swimming around with its head up. Right off the coast of Monterey, let me back up a couple of slides here and show you. Right off the coast of California there, you go out a couple miles and it drops off into a trench. The water is incredibly deep. I think more than 10,000 feet. And that's where this creature was seen. Um, and it washed up after these seals went out and killed it one day, a big war between a bunch of seals and this big creature. It washed up on the beach a day or two later. But in the 1930s and 40s, other creatures were seen by the Monterey Sardine Fleet. At that time, that was the sardine capital of the world. One crew with 12 men watched it. Here's their report. They said it uh, stared at them with large, baleful eyes from a rounded head that topped a long, slender neck that stuck out of the water a distance of eight or more feet. And there's another book about California's sea monsters, if you want to get it from CSE. Um, there's just so much material, like, for instance, the White River Monster in Newport, Arkansas. I interviewed folks who saw it. The man who took that picture is uh, Cloyce Warren. I talked to Cloyce on the phone. He said, look, I had a whole roll of pictures taken of that creature. I took them down to the newspaper office and said, here, you've been laughing at us for saying there's something in this lake. Here's still in the roll. You develop it. 
Well, some idiot at the newspaper office didn't realize this was color film, and he developed it with black and white developer and ruined the entire role. So they called Cloyce and said, oops, uh, sorry. Anyway, he said, this other picture I got's not nearly as good. But you can see the body at the far right, kind of a big body, and then a bunch of bumps down its back. Cloyce and everybody else who saw it claims it's a, probably a Basilosaurus or a Zooglodon or something similar to that with bumps down its back, two front flippers. Uh, most people would say an extinct dinosaur, but apparently not. It hasn't been seen since 72, when they had a big flood and the river filled in quite a bit. The river used to be 100 feet deep. Now it's only 50 feet deep at that point. But Arkansas Senate passed a resolution to protect the White River Monster. Jupiter, Florida, something was seen. Here's the article about the guy who saw it. He told me he saw this creature surface as he was flying out seven or eight miles off the coast of Jupiter, Florida. Uh, John Messick uh, wrote me that email about this creature. In Vermont, there's a lake between Vermont and New York called Lake Champlain. Many people claim they've seen the Lake Champlain monster. I talked to Sandy, who took this picture on the front of the book. I said, Sandy, do you think you saw a dinosaur? She said, oh, no. I know I saw a dinosaur. She and her husband and two kids watched it for 10 minutes, and I, she describes that on the videotape number three again. Okay, 1998, 58 people saw it again just a couple years ago. It is regularly reported. When I went there to Lake Champlain, I talked to folks that lived along the lake. I said, have you ever seen the Lake Champlain monster? Some said, no, it's just a joke. Some said, yeah, I've seen it, but I wouldn't tell anybody because you're going to get laughed at. I mean, if you go home and say, hey, I was out fishing and I saw a dinosaur, what are your friends going to think? <laughs> Something went wrong, right? A little too much sunlight out there, right? Uh, one more story and we got to quit. In Pensacola, Florida, right here, this sketch was drawn by Edward Brian McCleary, who was the only survivor when five kids went scuba diving. Out, you know where the sunken ship is out off the base there, Steve? You ever seen that old sunken ship sticking up? What's the name of that ship? The Massachusetts, I think? Anyway, they sank it, I think, as target practice after the war, purposely or something. But uh, it was an old ship they're getting rid of. So these guys are going to go out scuba diving. That's a pretty good distance out to this ship. Okay. And Edward McClary is the only survivor. Here's his, here's his report, word for word. He said, we were in an Air Force rescue raft. Now, understand, one of the kids was in, one of the kids who did not come back, his dad was real high up in Air Force res Sea Rescue. So he had gotten on one of these big Air Force rescue rafts, and these five kids, late teenagers, 16, 17, 18, 19, are going to go scuba diving. He said, we were bound for a sunken ship a few miles off the coast. Midway out, we were caught in a storm and dragged out to sea. When the storm cleared, we were in a dense fog, and we began to hear strange noises, rather like the splashing of a porpoise, also a sickening odor like that of dead fish. The noise got closer to the raft, and it was then we heard a loud hissing sound. Out in the fog, we saw what looked like a long pole, about 10 feet high, sticking straight up out of the water. On top was a bulb-like structure. I assume he means light bulb shape, round with a beak on it like the other creature we saw a minute ago. It bent in the middle and went under. It appeared several more times, getting closer to the raft. The silence was broken once again by something out of the fog. I can only describe it as a high-pitched whine. We panicked. All five of us put on our fins and went into the water. Now, at this point, people asked him, why, did you, why didn't you stay in the raft? He said, man, I don't know. It's all we could think of. You know, this thing's getting closer. You know, we're scuba divers, so we felt safer in the water. That probably a dumb mistake, but, you know, they did it. Keep together and try for the ship, I yelled. After we were in the water, we became split up in the fog. From behind, I could hear the screams of my comrades one by one. I got a closer look at the thing just before my last friend went under. The neck was about 12 feet long brownish green and smooth looking. The head was like that of a sea turtle. There appeared to be what looked like a dorsal fin when it dove under for the last time. Also, as best I'm able to recall, the eyes were green with oval pupils. So the guy's getting a pretty good look at it. He uh, swam to the ship. He said, I finally made it to the ship, the top of which protruded from the water, and it still does today, by the way, and stayed there for most of the night. Early that morning, I swam to shore and was found by the rescue unit. That's the sketch he drew as the only survivor. I told this story in a meeting when I was speaking at Fort Walton Beach down the road here. A lady came to me afterwards. Her name is Val Bill. There's her address. She said, Mr. Hoven, my son, stepson, Larry Bill, was one of the kids who did not return. She said, my husband, his dad, was uh, involved in Air Force rescue for the government. 
If the president would have gone down, he would have been one of the ones to go after him. The guy was real high up in rescue. He said they searched in vain. One drowned teenager was found. One body was found. The other three were never found. I called Edward Brian McCleary. I chased him down. He's in Jacksonville, Florida. He refuses to talk about it. His wife told me after this incident, when he was like 18 years old, he became an alcoholic and a drug addict. And he doesn't want to talk about it. He's afraid it'll, you know, stir up these memories or something. But that was right here in Pensacola, Florida.